corn and wheat futures traded to the downside and put a cap on buying interest in the soy complex. But the big action in today's markets was in livestock, where the cattle complex was sharply lower and lean hog futures were mixed. Live from locales where there is not a maniacal blizzard via Farm Journal broadcast, this is AgriTalk. <laughs> This afternoon, it's a conversation with Jeff Hogendorn from Professional Ag Marketing. Directly following the news, Oliver Slope from Blue Line Futures. I'm a handsome newsman, Davis Michelson. Now, here's the host of AgriTalk, Jeff Flory. It is not a blizzard in Northeast Iowa. Correct. Although, I will say this. Uh-huh. I, I just hit refresh on the radar. Okay. And with the amount of precipitation that is falling, and it's March 14th. It is March 14th. We should not have ruled out the potential for a blizzard across the upper Midwest uh, today. It's uh, big time rains from Iowa, southern Wisconsin, through Michigan and up into Ontario happening right now. And, of Mm -hmm. course, that line of storms that made its way across Illinois, Indiana, and, uh, yeah, Illinois and Indiana earlier today making Mm -hmm. its way into Ohio right now. So. And what is what? What are all these warnings down here? Tornado watch. We've yeah. got tornado watch mm-hmm. in place from eastern Illinois all the way down to northern Texas. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Heads up. Well, yeah, they say it's National Pie Day, and what that what that mm-hmm. really means, and where this comes from, few people know this. Uh, yep. What you do is you take the weather risk and you yep. multiply it by pie on this day. That's how oh. they came up with the name for it. That's why they call this day gotcha. Pie Day. I got gotcha. you took me a while to, to flesh that out, but it's there. All right. So I mentioned a few of my favorite pies earlier this, you know, on the morning show. Yes, you did. There, there's one that I did not mention. And it it's a because list. I don't, You missed they, one? They, they, yeah. They, <laughs> and I don't know. It, I, you know, I thought about it, but I didn't mm-hmm. mention it because I think people might kind of go, ooh. Okay. Minced meat. See, I was thinking turkey pot pie. How can that well, not be on the list? That. Minced meat pie, of course. Good Minced one. Minced meat pie. Donna uh-huh. Barber. Donna Barber's minced meat. Oh, oh, my gosh. When I was growing up, we mm-hmm. used to, my dad and I would wait for, for Keith and Donna to show up and yeah. bring that pie over on Christmas. Oh, my gosh. That was Donna so Barber. Yes. I don't accept pies from my barber anymore. Um, long story. <laughs> I get it. I get it. <laughs> Welcome to Agri Talk. I'm Chip. That's Davis. Happy yeah. Pie Day. Uh, we're gonna looking forward to the conversation with Jeff from Professional Ag Marketing yeah. coming up here in just a little bit. All right, let's go ahead and get started. What you got? Chip May soft red winter wheat futures opened to lower and on session highs and closed below yesterday's low. That points to a test of support at Monday's low of five twenty three and a half. May hard red winter wheat futures spiked support at Monday's low and recovered to close just above that level. Export sales of wheat in the weekend at March 7 totaled just under 84,000 metric tons. That was surprisingly in line with very lackluster trade expectations. Yeah. Mexico topped the list of wheat buyers. July HRW wheat futures 11 and one half cents lower today, 568. July SRW wheat down 11 cents, 547 and one quarter. July spring wheat closed at 660 and a half, down seven cents. Mexico tops the list of buyers, Chip. Right, right. And. On the supply side of the wheat market right now, we're trying to figure out what's the supply going to be out of France? What's the supply mm-hmm. going to be out of Ukraine? What about Russia? And now Australia is getting into that conversation again, too. So there's some movement on the supply side of the balance sheets. Corn export sales in the weekend at March 7 totaled 1.283 million metric tons, and that was at the high end of trade expectations. Japan was at the top of the list of buyers in the weekly sales report. USDA this morning also announced the sale of 100,000 metric tons of U.S. corn for delivery to Mexico in the current marketing year. Crop watchers note the dry and drier trend for Safrina corn crop price, uh, corn crop areas in Brazil, but the corn market could not overcome the negative influence of today's wheat market. May corn posted a high range open. Dropped to spike support at Monday's low and then saw a low range close. Yeah. May corn futures seven and one half cents lower today, four thirty three and three quarters. July corn down seven and one quarter to four forty six and a quarter. December corn futures closed at four sixty seven and three quarter, down five and one quarter cents, Chip. 
it was the day that I think the corn market really wanted to focus on demand. We got a decent weekly export sales number. We got a daily export sales announcement. It should have helped that corn market out more than what it did today. May soybean futures opened slightly lower than rallied through resistance at 12 bucks. The market failed to find buying interest above 12 bucks, sending prices downward to close just below the opening range. Export sales of soybeans weekended March 7 totaled 376,000 metric tons. That was in line with trade expectations. China was at the uh, the top of the list of buyers. Soybean meal sales in the week totaled nearly 210,000 metric tons, and bean oil sales of just over 11,000 metric tons were up by two-thirds from the four-week average. May soybean futures a penny and a half lower today, 11.95 and a quarter. July beans down a half cent to 12.09 and three quarters. November beans close at 11.87, up a penny on the day. Some products spreading today. May meal up a buck. May oil down 18 points. Cotton export sales weekended March 7, 85,800 running bales. Turkey and China crowded the top of the buyer's list. July cotton fell 108 points to 93.26. Yeah. On your livestock's beef export sales, latest reporting period, 11,200 metric tons, down by one-fifth from the prior four-week average. Heavyweight choice graded box beef. Up a buck five this morning on modest movement April fat cattle, two ninety seven and one half lower today at one eighty six ninety five. April feeder futures plunged four sixty seven and a half to two fifty one seventeen and a half. On the snout side, export sales uh, of pork twenty five thousand metric tons down about a quarter from the four week average. April hogs fifteen cents higher eighty five oh two and a half. Chip. All right, thank you very much, Davis. Let's bring in Oliver Slope, Blue Line Futures. How you doing, Oliver? D- doing well, Chip. How about yourself? Yeah. I'm doing okay. Getting ready for that K-State-Iowa State game tonight. Big, big games. Uh, big, yeah, Big Ten big. Championship. Nebraska's got the winner of uh, Big Ten State or Indiana today, so we'll, yeah. we'll see. Yeah. yeah, they've actually got a ball team over there in Lincoln. <laughs> Ever since I said they didn't. They've, yep. they've been on a hot streak. That's right. That's right. Hey, the cattle complex got ugly, dude. What happened? Yeah, it, it, it got ugly. You know, last week we were, we were talking about the potential to, to break out above the gap. It looked like we were going to do it last Friday, and then we, we failed and kind of pulled back. No technical damage was done at, at, on last Friday's trade, but it really you know dampened the expectations, especially for the April contract where the shot clock is starting to wind down, no pun intended there, and the volume shifts out to the June contract. And it's just kind of like, what what's that catalyst going to be, you know, with, with time winding down that's going to provide the breakout and kind of tempered our optimism and turned us a little bearish here recently. Again, today's trade, you know, a big reversal, but no technical damage done seasonally. This isn't a great time to be super bullish cattle. So I was working with clients throughout the week to kind of manage some of that downside risk uh, in case we do get a breakout of the recent range to the downside. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right. You know, corn down seven cents today, and it felt like it was worse than that, didn't it? <laughs> it really did. <laughs> uh, but, it, but I mean, again, same with cattle. Yeah, it, it felt bad and it felt harsh, but we're just kind of back testing the breakout point for March 7th, 4.30, okay. 4.33. It's going to be a big level here into the weekend. Gotcha. Good stuff. Thank you, Oliver. We'll talk to you later. Take care. All right, Oliver Slope, Blue Line Futures. Man, we've got a long list of issues that I want to get to with Jeff Hogendorn. He is with Professional Ag Marketing. Uh, We're going to do that next. Uh, You know, I feel like we need to start with what's happening in the cattle trade after the way that market was today. If the world is your oyster, we've got pearls of wisdom on AgriTalk. I'm not sure this song applies to $190 fat cattle in the October contract anymore. Just saying. Are we going to try to figure out the next $2 move? Is that what it is? My the next, next $2, $2 move? move, I'm on or something. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, you might have to work on that. Call Phil. We'll Call Phil. Phil in on this. We'll yeah, bring get him Phil in. in on this. Yep. Yeah. See, see if you guys can uh, hammer something out and and, and turn that into a... In yeah. a theme song for the for the cattle market. Love you keep it. going here. I'm gonna I'm gonna hop on that. All right. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Welcome back to Agri Talk. I'm your host Chip Flory. That guy shuffling off to call Phil. Yeah, can't talk now. 
Can't talk. Stavis Michelson. All right, let's bring in Jeff Hogendor, and he is the he is with Professional Ag Marketing, and he joins us right now. Jeff, it's great to talk with you again. How are you? Oh, we're doing great up here in Minnesota, Chip. Uh, you know, it's hard to hard to even notice that winter's happening. To be quite honest with you. Yeah, here it is, the middle of March. We got all this rain blowing through. It could have really easily been a foot or two of snow, Jeff. Yeah, you're exactly right. But you know, up up this way, we've we've missed all pretty much all the moisture, even. So mm-hmm. we're kind of wondering if it can still happen or not. And hopefully, we get our fair share right there about uh, July fourth is what we're hoping for. <laughs> let's t- if if we're gonna time it, let's time it perfectly. I like the way you're yep. thinking there. <laughs> right during the parades, absolutely. Uh, yep, <laughs> love it. All right, let's start with cattle, if we could. Uh, just simply because it's such a big move to the downside, kind of a, I don't know if you'd call it a washout, but some chart damage was done, and and here we are wondering, you know, did we miss an opportunity? Yeah, that's exactly the what we're all asking ourselves right now, no question about it. Um, first of all, yeah, big day today. Um, you know, one of the things that I know a lot of people were watching and this was absolutely textbook on the April futures, guys. Um, we ran up and we we filled the gap from last October yep. to an absolute T. And then we almost immediately started giving up strength there. And then we ended up, you know, with a lower low than yesterday, lower low than most of the week, really. And, you know, that is so textbook. I, I It is almost like. Why would the market do completely what it's supposed to do? You know, it's just, it was really amazing to watch today. I, I, just, I couldn't believe my eyes most of the day, to be quite honest with you. But I love it. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's a case that we've been talking. I want to get the date on this one. We've been talking about that October 23rd downside yep. price gap for so long that, it almost felt like today became a self-fulfilling prophecy once we filled that gap, right? Yeah, and and that's that's somewhat what technicals are about, right? Yeah, that's Is, true. It's it's people, and especially on the hedge side. I mean, we we all like to look at, you know, I would say some of those technical um, observations that maybe aren't super complicated, right? Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, we're looking at that, thinking, and you know, not to mention you're at a dollar ninety. Um, on the Aprils, and you're starting to creep up, you know, over a dollar ninety in many of those back months, um, pushing up even you know dollar eighty seven and some change on October, for an example. So, you know, a lot of things colliding there to get a lot of sell pressure from the hedge perspective. Um, you also like the idea that you're sitting here in the middle of March, not a bad time from a seasonal perspective to be looking at some coverage. But, you know, a lot of the cattle that we have on inventory today uh, work just fine at these at these levels. Um, you know, highs of today being a couple bucks higher, obviously worked even better. So there's a few different reasons why I think, you know, from a hedger's perspective, we, we got some pressure there today. And then, you know, I would say some of the smaller time speculative type money as once when the momentum started to shift and we had some of those technical items triggered, I think it was pretty easy for them to jump on board as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, let, I, I don't know. I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on the supply side fundamentals. Uh, we know that they're tight. The, the demand side of the balance sheet on beef, we've got the heavyweight choice box beef. This morning traded up to three ten eighty seven. It's been higher than that in in the in the morning trade this week, but that's up a dollar five. The heavyweight select boxes up forty cents to three oh one forty four. We we've got both markets over three hundred bucks. I think it's the first time ever at this time of the year, and right. it, and we've got a spread that's under ten bucks. I, I'm. I, dude, I'm confused. I do not well, know what to make of this. Well, I think is equally as interesting to that combination. And I think the select being over 300 bucks is probably the most amazing part yeah. for this time of year. But also you think about the import 
export situation. And we've been preaching this for a while and maybe we'll end up being wrong about it, but I kind of doubt it. I mean, the import, the pressure to import meat right now is, is very great. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that makes good sense. To, and we've seen it, uh, we've seen the January numbers. Uh, maybe that was almost a week ago already. I can't remember if that was first part of this week or last week, okay. guys. But, you know, Brazil just flooded that market. They just hammered imports in here during the month of oh. January. And what we're hearing is that continued um, in, you know, halfway or so through February. And then they actually filled up the, their quota already. Um, but then to have select meat at $300 in March is very impressive. And that's all the, that's all the grinding meat. That's all the hamburger. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the demand on some of this, even whether it's fast food type service stuff, or, or we've seen it where people stay home a little bit more, they hit the hamburger pretty hard, but go back to the weather on this protein, um, demand guys, we see it, uh, in, in some of the hog cuts were, but I think we're seeing it in this beef grinding beef too. I think people are putting hamburgers on the grill and it's mm-hmm. showing up on the, on the price points in my opinion. Wow. wow. Uh, it, it, it is an impressive move that we're seeing on the demand side. And, you know, I said there wasn't a whole lot to talk about on the, on the supply side, but there's always management of the, the supply of those market ready cattle. Uh, the yep. Packers are going to be trying to, manage that supply to their advantage going forward right that's exactly the way we see it um and uh, maybe we give them a little too bit much credit i don't think so i think they're very good business people um mm-hmm. and know their business very well and i i think one of their ways that they're com- going to combat combat this uh, supply situation that everybody knows will continue to shrink as you go through 2024 is to slow down kills before they're forced to slow down kills. Okay. And I, I think that's what they're doing today. We're supposed to have still, you know, one, one and a half percent more cattle on feed compared to last year. And we've got kill rates running like 5% less than last year. Below. So yeah. that math just shows me that we are holding on to some cattle. I think, uh, it's going to be really interesting as you maybe get 30 days down the road or something. I, I, I think we'll start to know whether we're right about that or not. Um, but it, the margin over feed from a feedlots perspective, it's so easy just to say, yeah, let's not worry about selling them this week. Let's keep them around yeah. another week. Um, put them a few more pounds on them. See if the market will go up a buck or two. Um, mm-hmm. And then until you get into April, then it's, then you're kind of to the point like, boy, you better be pretty serious if you want to be holding these cattle from, yeah. you know, seasonally. What's your high point going into May? Right. Right. Okay. All right. Um, let, let's switch gears a bit. Uh, the, the announcement that Tyson is, show, is shutting down the pork plant there in Perry, Iowa. How big of a deal is it? And, and how much of a surprise is it? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked about that because I, I, I think it is a, a big deal um, and quite a surprise. So part of what we're we're looking at here, and I think this might bleed over into the beef complex too for whatever it's worth, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, the whole protein sector has had a pretty tough go of it, um, probably more so on the hog side, especially on the live production side, but the last couple of years. And margins from a packing perspective, have been fairly narrow over there too, but you know most of those those larger corporations do have some vertical integration, and then the you know the live production economics have just been mm-hmm. horrendous you know through 2023. So what we see happening there, from my perspective, is these the the folks like Tyson are out there trying to make some adjustments, trying to make their companies more efficient, mm-hmm. and so they start looking at some of their most their you know, less efficient assets um, and, and start wondering if we should shut those down. And I think that's where Perry kind of ended up, um, you know, is just being a smaller plant, yeah. having maybe a few issues from a productivity standpoint and that, that got the, got the ax okay. there. Okay. Okay. We're going to, we're, we're going to have to finish that conversation when we come back because I think there's a little bit more to hit there. Jeff Hogan Dorn, he is with Professional Ag Marketing here on AgriTalk.
Let's go to the markets page at profarmer.com and check today's closes. Where July HRW wheat futures were 11 and one half cents lower today, 568. July SRW wheat down 11 cents to 547 and one quarter. May corn futures were seven and one half cents lower at 433 and three quarters. December corn futures closed at 467 and three quarters. That's down five and one quarter cents. May soybean futures a penny and a half lower at 1195 and a quarter. Novi beans closed at 1187. That's up a penny on the day. July cotton fell 108 points to 9326. On your livestock, April live cattle 297 and one half lower at 186.95. April feeder futures uh, fell 467 and a half to 251, 17 and a half. And April lean hogs 15 cents higher at 8502 and a half. TryProFarmer.com, won't you? Opinions expressed on AgriTalk do not necessarily reflect the views of Farm Journal Broadcasting, affiliate stations, or sponsors. We don't make the news, we render it. AgriTalk. Welcome back to AgriTalk. I'm Chip. Glad you're with us. We are in the middle of a conversation with Jeff Hogendorn. He is with Professional Ag Marketing. Uh, Jeff, at the end of the last segment, we were talking about Tyson's decision to shut down the pork plant there in Perry, Iowa. That's It's going to be in the second half of June sometime. Davis, didn't you say it's like June 24th? I want to say the 28th. 28th, yep. okay. Yep. Um, how, how much stress might that put on the rest of the Midwest Packers to absorb that supply, Jeff? Yeah, and I, I think uh, the way we look at it, you kind of got to peel back the layers on this just a yeah. little bit. Yeah. So um, I was essentially – that plant was responsible for just under 2% of our total shackle space in the, in the U S um, pork business. So 2%, 4% is a huge deal, huge, huge deal. Yeah. Um, 2% is a, a pretty big deal in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's going to be some opportunity and, and Tyson has come out and said, Hey, we're, you know, we're trying to make ourselves more efficient, like we talked about in the last mm-hmm. segment. And mm-hmm. and so we're going to do that at some of these other plants. We're going to crank up some of these um, other plants. We're going to try and, and they don't want to lose that business either on the backside of the plant as far as the meat goes. But, and then the other thing you'll see happen is, you know, where this really matters in the pork business is when you get past these summer supply crunches. So, you know, we're, we don't really need all of our packers from basically here until Labor Day. Okay. Um, okay, but past yeah. that, seasonally the supply ramps up a bunch, as you guys know, um, and that's where we're going to really miss having Perry. The way we look at it is, sow units or sow herd has been decreasing um, in the past year and a half or so, and we should start to see the effects of that lower sow unit um, sow inventory any day here, and that should continue to be more and more of a factor. And until you get to the end of the year and maybe you see one and a half or 2% less pigs than what we saw last year. Well, the other number we just talked about is now we're going to have 2% less shackle also. Right. Right. So I would say the Packer leverage situation as it affects our markets is going to be similar this coming winter as it was this past winter. Now you asked about, you know, other portions of the industry and and what we're going to do is other Packers are going to have a little bit easier time scheduling those Saturday shifts, maybe putting a few more hours in, um, knowing that we've got one less plant out there. So that's going to help some as you get into those fall months and uh, should should be able to relieve some of the pressure. But we're still going to see a situation where the packer, I think, is going to be very much in control um, you know, over at least what portion of, of what our hogs get priced off. Okay. Okay. Let's uh, there's you're right about there being layers to this story and trying to figure out exactly what it's going to mean for the market moving forward. So we'll continue to talk about it and continue to pay attention to it. Had a an email earlier, Jeff, uh, they just wanted to know very simply, why are the corn and the soy? Why are the structure of the corn and soybean markets 
as different as they are. What they're referring to is you got the July beans at twelve oh nine and three quarters on today's close, and then the November at a discount eleven eighty seven. In the corn market, July four forty six and Dees the new crop at a premium at four sixty seven. Why the premium in new crop corn and the discount in new crop beans? Well, I I think the uh, the corn one's maybe going to be that's a little easier answer. So we're going to start there. Does that sound like okay. a plan, Chip? You bet. Um, you bet. So and and I know this is extremely confusing, and, and that's a great question. But I think the the somewhat the way to think about it is we know we're going to have some leftover corn as we transition from old crop into new crop. Okay. We were that that situation is burdensome enough or comfortable enough is probably the better term um, that we know we're going to have leftover corn. So what the marketplace is trying to do is it's encouraging somebody to hold that corn from basically July to fall. So another way to think about it is like, okay, let's say that July, we all think July should be higher than December. Absolutely Mm -hmm. agree with that. And, that, and my guess is that's why it'll actually shake out in the cash market, okay? okay? But say today July futures were trading higher than December. Well, what would everybody do? They would all sell their corn in July, right. which essentially then would push that market lower, right? So it's kind of like market economics, if you will. When you have a very comfortable supply situation, the market's going to want to encourage somebody or pay somebody to hold those bushels over. So you flip mm-hmm. over and look at the soybeans, we're not as comfortable over there. We can speed up demand a little bit. Um, we can start looking at a little bit smaller yield um, as we get more into growing season. To me, that that uh, supply or projected ending stocks can get um, narrower faster, if you will, or it takes gotcha. less of an event to right. to get to the point of like oh shoot now we might be running out of soybeans um, and that's why they continue to keep the old crop marketplace a little bit higher than the new crop. The, so it's as much a function other, of of old crop demand as it is new crop fundamentals. I would say that's a hundred percent correct. Okay. Yep. yep. Gotcha. And the, and the other thing that you always got to look at on the bean market is we have two crops. You got the North American crop and you got the South yep. American one. And that that does some funky things with the spread market too. So part of what November might be looking at is, well, shoot, not too much after we get done harvesting this November crop, we got to deal with the next South American crop. Again, yep. You know. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Well, and then the estimates that we're getting uh, on on the South American crop, the Brazilian bean crop in particular, you made a note, Conab in at one forty seven million metric tons earlier this week. But that's like right in the middle of a super, super wide range of trade guesses on what the size of that Brazilian bean crop is going to be, Jeff. I don't know how this thing sorts out. Yeah, I, I don't I don't either. And I know a lot of people are frustrated with the, the U.S. numbers, um, you know, probably being some of the highest ones that that we're seeing there. Um, so, no, I, I'm not sure either where we all where we end up where on this but i I do think we're getting close to the time frame where the market is going to move past this discussion so i i think for the best thing we can do from like a producer standpoint as we decide you know do we want to sell some of our crop this week or do we want to sell it next month or three months from now is to start thinking you know further down the road start thinking about acres for this year and i know everybody's talking about this but i'm I'm just encouraging us to kind of switch gears a little bit here um you know think about what the balance sheet could possibly look like think about you know that planning report is getting awful close here that's sneaking right past uh, as we cruise through march um you know and then what can happen to get us some decent rallies and some selling opportunities and and what is our plan going to be if we start seeing some of those opportunities jeff this feels like a real rally in beans already what doesn't it absolutely absolutely and you know from a seasonal perspective we should we should just be getting started as far as the volatility 
um, of the season. And, and I'm pretty disappointed with today. I, I felt way better here. What was it? You know, 10 o'clock or so when we were hitting those highs and man, yeah. what a big jump higher on that bean market. And, but I tell you what, this bean, bean market is, uh, it doesn't always make sense. There's a lot of global things that impact it. Um, and so I, and it can move awful quick. So, yeah. you know, putting together a plan today, in my opinion, you know, most of the levels that we're getting offered to us in the last couple of weeks, just, just don't make a lot of sense for the business, right? They just don't make much for profitability, but putting a plan together, you know, at numbers that are twelve, fifty, thirteen dollars seems crazy, but this thing when it starts moving, it can really move. Sure can. You know, it the February twenty nine low in July beans was eleven forty and a half. And today's high, we closed well off today's high, but today's high was twelve thirty and three quarters. The market's already moved ninety cents. Yep. You you look at what happened in beans and compare it to what's happening in corn, and corn just feels like an underperformer in here, right? Yeah, and, and some of what you're seeing with that big of a move in the soybeans is, um, you know, we, we started that pretty much the exact same day as when we hit our record short on managed money funds, right? Yep, so, yep. Yeah, their next step apparently, and I don't think crazy surprising, is start to you know liquidate some of that short position, and that's you know where we can quickly get a dollar out of the soybeans. Now, the other thing that's going on, on the soybean side in the last three days or so, and this was a better argument when we were at the highs of the day too. But look at that soybean oil market that also yeah. put in some new highs today, and you know it's kind of quietly putting on a good three, four day rally here, getting some nice exports, got the crude oil also helping it out um, the, this week as well. Uh, and that's really helping putting some extra fire into that bean complex is from, from my perspective. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Jeff, if people want to get in touch with you, where do they go? Well, we've got a website. We've got a lot of fundamental information on there, actually, that's free to the public, professionaleggmarketing.com. Um, that'll also get you some email address and whatnot. But otherwise, the old-fashioned way, give us a holler on the old telephone, 507-449-2030. Perfect. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate you, man. Thank you very much. You bet. Jeff Ogendorn, Professional Ag Marketing. Davis and I will be right back. The best talkers in ag, including you. Join the conversation on AgriTalk. Call us at 855-4-TALK-AG. I think they're doing uh, steak tips again at the diner up the street. Yeah. Had it about two weeks ago. Man, it yeah. was good. <laughs> that some was sort gravy? Of, sort of sauce. It was more of a sauce than a gravy. Yeah? I believe it was a sauce. It was very fancy. <laughs> Is that what it was? There's no word for what this food is in English. Um, but gotcha. We might be going to get some of that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Steak tips. Welcome back to AgriTalk, everyone. Your pal, Davis Michelson here. We're having supper chat. We're looking ahead to the <laughs> supper hour already. Uh, yeah. yeah. Lunch Lunch apparently has failed us in some way. I, I, we, none of us can focus now. Right. Oliver Slope. Tick tock, tick tock. The clock is ticking on April cattle. Do you know what he might have meant by that? The <laughs> just maybe that we're we're coming up the, to the actual season, April. Yeah. Well, this well, there's that, but it's also the seasonalities of the cash market. Uh huh. Okay, so typically see some strength at this time of the year. That's fine, but by the time you get into April. The, the seasonal strength tends to leave the market. So if you're going to run up there and make some highs, mm -hmm. you're either going to do it now or you're going to have to wait until, you know, the August, September move. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, summer doldrums. Interesting. Is, is oh. kind of what we're going to be making our way into. 
All right. Well, let's uh, let's sort of meld this together then with yesterday's conversation about the October contract okay. at 190. We're down a buck 97 and a half to 185. 15. Mm -hmm. uh, is, th is the wind completely out? I mean, 190 can't certainly be off the table at this point. Oh, However, no. I mean, we got a setback here. Now we, now we got like five bucks to go to make well, it back see, up. And that's, th that's the thing. Um, <laughs> we, we talk about the chart points mm -hmm. and the way that the April contract rolled up there filled that October 23 downside gap exactly mm -hmm. and then posted a downside reversal I mean it's not sexy it it, it well unless you're willing to trade it from the short side of the market mm -hmm. and if you are that's a very sexy signal <laughs> and you want to be you want to be jumping <laughs> into that pit with hands out palms mm -hmm. out sell 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 so, does that happen, or does a $310 plus heavyweight choice and a $300 plus select choice box beef market kind of overwhelm mm. that side of, of the market? Does the demand side, does it become... Boy, it just seems so strange to even think it. But does de is demand the thing that could send the, you know override a, a uh, the technical sell signal and turn the markets back to the upside, even at this price? Yeah. You know, real demand. That's the thing. That that that's the thing. If if you've got a higher box beef price and you sell less beef. That's not more demand, all right? It, it, the higher beef price is slowing down utilization or consumption of that beef. Therefore, it's lower demand at a higher price. But if you, if we find a way to move the same amount of beef at a higher price, mm -hmm. that's a true increase in demand. Okay. And that's the kind of thing that can get a cattle market to change its attitude. And that's, that's when all of a sudden uh, $310 plus choice graded box beef prices matter mm -hmm. each and every day yeah. to the direction of the cattle market. Did I see movement at 54 loads? Uh, yeah, pretty light. Report? Yeah. Very pretty light. light. I want to see what the afternoon report says here first. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be interesting. Um, Jeff, uh, Jeff Hogendorn, mentioned something that alluded to something that you've talked about before in reference to the Perry, Iowa closure uh, of that hog processing facility, uh, a victim of less efficiency basically is, is what he said the way that I've heard you and, and others put it, although I think you came up with this. Um, one of the jobs of the market is to hold the high cost producer underwater long enough to reallocate those resources that, that production infrastructure to a lower cost producer Mm -hmm. um, is is this one of those cases? Because because the I margins, am not, I am yeah. not convinced of that, Davis. Mm -hmm. Tyson's Tyson's big issue on processing was not on hogs; it was on beef. Mm. Um, and so to it, it's. Uh, this is they must just be looking at that Perry plant and saying it just costs too much money to keep that plant open. Mm -hmm. It it it's uh, it's too outdated, and I don't know if this is true or not, but they must be looking at it and saying it's too outdated to spend the money on it to 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 bring it up to snuff so that we can keep that place. Uh, open and operational. Mm -hmm. I just I, I I need to talk to more people. Yeah, yeah. to to figure this one out completely. Yeah, oh, that's an it's disappointing. Dang it! It really is. It really that's is. That's not uh, what, what we it? like talking about. Nine thousand head a day. Um, yeah, two percent. Yeah.
I'm uh, when I visit Alaska this weekend, I'm going to bring my speedo. I'm Are you? <laughs> yeah, I was the just forecast going doesn't there. lie, baby. Yeah, I was gonna just be going there. Beautiful well, up there. You don't. Yeah, you're not going to want to wear it uh, up here in the in Northeast Iowa. It looks like below <laughs> normal temperatures. Uh, March 20th through the 24th, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, most of Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Got near normal temperatures to the south and east of that. Above normal precipitation expected over the entire Corn Belt. Dang and near you got to get out to Ohio. <laughs> yeah. You get out, get out to Ohio and you run out of that. Yeah. So, but still, and above normal precipitation in the 8 to 14 day as like well. Yep. Tomorrow's Friday. Woo-hoo. That means tomorrow morning we got a free for all coming your way on Agritalk. Talk.